Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League, we've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal. Listen now. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC Soccer Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Stephen Melendez, and I'm going to be bringing you the latest and greatest in soccer news from around the world. Welcome back, everyone, to your favorite soccer podcast. I'm here, ready to talk more soccer with you guys, more of our favorite sport in the world. Uh, We had a lot of action going on this week. We had some League Cup action, of course, domestic league still rolling right along uh, don't got much. Don't, don't got really much anything on Champions League. Nothing European football, uh, soccer. Uh, you know, just just really nothing going on. I mean, even the transfer news is a little bit quiet. I mean, there's a little bit there here and there. I'll have a little bit in that later on in the show. Not gonna have that for a full segment like I had it in the last episode because there really hasn't been much updates there. It's been a little bit quieter than I you know usually expect it to be during a transfer. Like as we get closer to the transfer window. Uh, but anyways, uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things today, starting with, of course, the Premier League. You know, always going to give my my thoughts on, you know, the games that have happened so far this week. And we have a few you know good matchups coming up. Uh, so I'm definitely going to be getting into that. Uh, second, I'm going to be talking about all the League Cup action that we just recently had this week. We had some of the DFB Pokal Cup. We had some uh, Carabao Cup as well. And I also want to talk about maybe some news that we that maybe you guys don't know about La Liga, Supercopa Italiana, Italiano. We're going to be talking about all those today in that segment. Third, uh, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, transfer news. And we're going to be talking about the other leagues as well. Just keeping you guys all updated on those. You know, we had some good uh, games come up this week uh, in, the other game, uh, in the other leagues as well. So we're going to be putting all that into segment number three. And the last part of the show, we're going to be talking about the top 10 current Denmark players. Yes, we are now in Denmark. They are, I believe it's the 12th best team in the world right now. And it's, I mean, they're one of those teams that it's not stacked with star power. I mean, certainly you got a lot of, you know, notable names up there on the top, but uh, it, it's really a, a team effort there with uh, with Denmark, and I'm excited to get into that list as well. So let's just start today's show with what we got from the Premier League uh, so far this week. Um, la- the last match day, match day 14, we uh, finish it off with a couple interesting games. You had Manchester United taking on Leeds United. Uh, you had Tottenham taking on Leicester City. You know, a nice match up there against two of the top teams in the league. Uh, you had Chelsea versus West Ham. Uh, would have been it would be interesting to see if Chelsea could answer the call and you know after losing two straight games, um, you know and, and tight ones at that if they could you know come out and, and get a good victory there against West Ham. Uh, and, and then you had the Wolves taking on Burnley, which you're expecting, uh, you know them to to you know after winning against Chelsea last week, coming out putting up another good effort and and hopefully getting a couple wins in a row and, and starting to build some momentum as we're now nearing up almost halfway into the season and they're still in the bottom half of the table. Uh, so short, uh, long story short, Wolves were not able to answer that call. They lost 2-1 to one, uh, against Burnley. And, and honestly, it, it, it was such a poor performance to give up two goals to a team that has been one of the worst, if not the worst offensive team. No, e- the worst offensive team, attacking team, whatever you want to call it, in the league so far, and it's just it, it's it's kind of feels like same old wolves. Like they, they, just the inconsistencies have 
continued to rear its ugly heads towards them. And, and they were thoroughly dominated in this game. Even though when you look at the stats, you wouldn't really tell from that because they had 64% possession. They had about five more shots than Burnley. But Burnley still had one more shot on target. They were much more efficient in this game. And even though... Wolves had more momentum and certainly, you know, you know, had more possession and were passing around a lot better. Uh, it still felt like Burnley had complete control of this game. They scored, uh, you know, pretty much shortly before halftime in the 35th minute from Ashley Barnes to take the lead. And then Chris Wood, who has been playing sensational, at least, you know, for, for you know, a bottom club like Burnley, he's still been one of their best players. He scored early on in the second half in the 51st minute to make it two to nothing and the wolves just couldn't do anything to really get themselves back into this game and 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 get some momentum they did eventually get within one with a penalty from fabio silva but it was too little too late for the wolves and they just dropped points once again couldn't even get one point and with that loss that makes it six for the season six and 14 games and three in their last four games. Just, it, it, it's it's either they win or they lose. Because they got, this is their last five games. Loss, that win against Chelsea. Two losses in a row and then another win. So it's like, you really every single week you just don't know what you're going to get from them. You really don't. Because... Sure, I mean, yeah, they lost against against Liverpool, Aston Villa, that w- that had the two red cards uh, late in that game, and, and it and it was it was a bad loss for them because you know that that um penalty that uh what, what's his name uh, Samedo, uh committed at the end of that game to give Aston Villa the penalty and, and and lose all the points there. They did end up beating Arsenal, but. Both those wins against Arsenal and Chelsea, and, and regardless you beat Chelsea, that's still a really good win, were 2-1 wins. So it's not like they dominated their competition either. So it's just you really don't know what kind of team you're going to be getting any any game that the Wolves go out there. It, it, so really there's there's no confidence you can really have on this team. And this is, this is just another one of those games that, that have that same feel. Uh, however, on the other hand, when you look at Manchester United, they have certainly hit their stride in the Premier League. They got off to a ridiculously hot start in this game. Scott McTominay, like my goodness, two goals in the first three minutes of this game. Guarantee you that's the first guy to do that this season. Two goals in three minutes to start the game incredible from him then Bruno Fernandes chips in gets it three nothing and then Victor Lindelof gets a 37th minute goal to make it four to nothing so this was all over these were all in the first half uh Leeds United were able to make it four to one to to at least make it a little close but then you got Daniel James chipping in and then Bruno Fernandes with a penalty to make it six one before Leeds United made it six six two to like I don't know consolation goal I don't know what you want to call it but this game was absolutely dominated by Manchester United. Yes, Leeds United did get a, a a lot of shots off. They had 17, but for the most part, they were desperation shots because Manchester United were thoroughly just taking over this game. They had complete momentum, weren't allowing Leeds United to get into any sort of rhythm that they you know normally would like to get into. And, I mean, it's just... And, and the, the best part about it for... Manchester United, the guys that usually score the goals, I mean, yes, Bruno Fernandes obviously chipped in, but Rashford, who's been in sensational this season, Anthony Martial, those guys did not chip in with a goal. It was Scott McTominay, Daniel James, Lindelof, obviously Bruno Fernandes with the brace as well. Uh, and and that, that's what you want to see as a Manchester United fan. You want to see an overall, you know, together game. And obviously they're, they're enjoying, they've been using Scott McTominay in that midfield a lot. A lot more than Donny van de Beek, which you expected to probably see there this season. Edison Cavani got a, got a look. I mean, Paul Pogba, too, you thought you were going to see him there a lot. And you're, you're seeing more McTominay and Fred. And it's obviously working for them. I mean, they've, they've been on an absolute roll. And it, it kind of feels similar to last season, where they started the season off terribly. I mean, obviously, they're still in that early parts of the season. I mean, they haven't even reached the halfway mark yet. But... 
it just has that 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 same feel where they just got off to such a horrid start. You know, you're wondering what's going on with them. Their defense is so inconsistent, but then all of a sudden they just get the this ramp of of wins where they just Leeds United six two, West Ham three one. They beat Southampton three two, Sheffield United three two. Defense, obviously, you can tell there by by the, the those scores are still a bit inconsistent. But even against Man City, that that terrible game, but they get a zero zero draw. They get points. They get a result. Uh, they beat obviously you got to beat West Brom. They beat them one zero. Uh, Everton three one. We go down. Obviously, the, the the worst loss they had was against Arsenal when they lost one zero. That was their most uh, recent loss in the Premier League. But still. Um, despite all the you know the, the the talks about how terrible their Champions League run uh, has ended, obviously it has motivated them to you know play at the top of their game, and they're certainly doing just that. And it's getting them back into contention of you know the, the top of the league. And when you look at their last games, they've picked up two points on Liverpool, and with a game still in hand on them, they can get within two points and be squarely in the running for the league title. And Honestly, it's incredible to even say that considering how bad they looked early on. And I don't want to go ahead and say, yes, they're contenders because I certainly don't believe they are. They, I, I think their defense certainly needs to get a lot better. I like Lindelof and Maguire, but I don't know what it is. And Juan Bissaka is, is one of the better right backs, right or fullback defenders in the entire world. I just, I don't, I don't know what it is. I feel like uh, that maybe that midfield needs to get a little bit more. Uh, rhythm together since you know they're they're just now using them consistently and uh but but i mean you gotta tip your hat to Solskjaer to be able to turn it around all the talks about him not being good enough to to lead this big club and you know now he's he's giving he's getting results uh even though they're not a hundred percent dominant even though this this game against Leeds united certainly was uh it, it's still getting results and that's all you can really ask for from your manager uh, but like when you and, and when you compare it to some of the other teams that were above them as of late, I mean obviously Everton they've got three wins in a row, which which just makes that uh, got about cup matchup, which I'm going to be talking about in the next segment. Uh, you know that that matchup between them and Everton, Man- Manchester United and Everton coming up next, even more exciting to watch. But you look at Chelsea, they've lost two games in a row before winning their last game. Uh, Tottenham, two losses and two draws in their last five games. Southampton, two draws, I mean, two losses and a draw in their last five games. It's just, you know, so even Leicester City, that are, that are just ahead of them by one point, uh, have lost two games in their last five. Each team are struggling a bit, dropping points, while Manchester United are playing their best at just the perfect moment and taking advantage of these teams dropping points. Even Liverpool, which, I mean, they're still dominant, but they've got two draws in their last five games while Manchester United have just one. So it's just a lot of very uh, opportunistic games that they're, you know, they're taking advantage of, and they need to. That That's just the, the gist of it. They need to be taking advantage of these games. And talking about some of these teams that are dropping points, I mean, Leicester City versus Tottenham was a big opportunity for Jose Mourinho and Tottenham to you know, reestablish themselves as one of the top teams in the Premier League, and they did anything but that. Uh, they gave up a penalty just before halftime. Jamie Vardy puts it, away, puts it away like he normally does, and then Toby Alderweireld in the 59th minute gets an own goal. And just two sloppy plays from Tottenham. Their offense wasn't even in a rhythm. They only had eight shots all game, three on target. It's just it's kind of hard to to really pinpoint what's going on with this team because early on in the season they just looked they looked unstoppable with Song and Kane and it just feels like if if a team is able to shut those guys out there is nobody else that can that can consistently create for them and, and that's why you know it's it's said all the time that soccer is more than just a one man game or even just a two man game it's it just it's not enough they need more from the other guys around them to really contribute and that's where a guy like Gareth Bale would would come in but he's still coming off the bench and I don't know whether it's because he's not showing enough in in um on the bench or I mean in in practice or whatnot but I feel like Gareth Bale being put on that right side would be 
the answer to them not having enough creation when Song and Kane are kind of like taken out of the game or focused on. And they, they, but they, they just need, they need to find a way to turn it around. They really, really do. And if they don't, they're just going to continue to fall. And you look at the standings right now. Like I said, they've, they've just lost two in a row. They've got 25 points. So they're still there. I mean, they, they started the season so well. So even with this little stretch of two draws and two losses in their last five games, they're still in the thick of the, uh, you know, of even the league title, you know, but even though, I mean, they drop any more points and, and I doubt they could catch up to Liverpool the way they're playing. I mean, teams need to be on the top of their game right now, especially with Liverpool, you know, yeah, they might drop some points here and there, but when they get a guy like Virgil van Dijk back towards the end of the season, you can, I mean, even though obviously that's going to be, you know, kind of late into the season, so... You know, who knows if he'll even have that much of an impact. But he's one of the best defenders in the league. And I mean one the best defender in the league. And I said I said in my last step in my last segment or in my last show, the best defender in the entire world. So he's obviously going to make an impact. And and you gotta look at it as also Leicester City. They're gonna be getting some of their guys back as well. Uh, they they still need to get Pereira back from injury and and he obviously you know does so much for their club. And you just got to look at some of these teams that you can obviously be taking advantage of. And they literally just played one of them. But they lost 2 nothing because it, it, they just can't create enough offense if they're, you know, someone n- not named Song or Kane are, you know, contributing. It's, it's just... It's it's just a poor poor effort, and they they just need to do better. It, it, that's just plain and simple. But you got to look at also on the other side, Leicester City taking care of business. They 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 take care of those. They take advantage of those, you know, mistakes and walk away with three points. And they are now in second place in the league. That that's how it works, man. That that really is how it works. And then when you look at Everton, they've. Pretty much taken care. I mean, obviously, we already talked about it that they beat Arsenal in the last game, but that's now three straight wins, and which is exactly what I'm talking about. Where you know, when when you got all these teams like within a point, two points, three points of each other, like Southampton at seven, or you can even go and put Man City at eight to Leicester City at two. There's only a four point difference. Four points. Obviously, Liverpool have kind of separated themselves a little bit with. You know, at 31 points there, obviously Man City at 23 got a big time gap to, you know, reach there. But when you look at those two to nine or two to two to eight, only four points. You so you every single game counts, and Tottenham are certainly not seeing that right now. Uh, but let's see, we look at some of the other games like Chelsea. Chelsea took care of their business. They got an early goal from Thiago Silva in the tenth minute. I believe it would be his 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 first goal for the club to make it three uh, to make it one nothing. And then Tammy Abraham, who I feel is so underrated because he is on a club with guys like Olivier Giroud, obviously Timo Werner, but he is such a good player. Tammy Abraham gets a brace in this game, and I feel like he should get more time. I mean, he's he's obviously still very young, and and it's going to take a little bit of time for him to get into a rhythm to actually play. But he is. A very, very good player. And certainly deserves to get uh, regular time. Uh, because he was one of their better players last year. At least, you know, he was... You know, it was his first time playing, you know, for such a big club. But uh, but still, you, you need to try to play him more. He's one, he's one of your younger players. Obviously, you know, Giroud was in, in such a hot form. So they had to use him. And Timo Werner clearly likes playing on the left side. He's quick enough to play on. And, and you know, technically good enough. To play on that side, but uh, still, Chelsea, you know, still get the three points thanks to Tammy Abraham's brace and Thiago Silva's first goal for the club. And overall, just a very solid game from them. And that's what I'm talking about. They took care of business and are fifth in the league after getting this win. You know, although they did drop two games before that and one to, you know, a Wolves team that you should expect them to beat and another to an Everton team who are on a hot streak right now. But still, uh, they get the win here, three points, and you know are still in that thick, the thick of the race there. Uh, but now let's talk about some of the games coming up in match day fifteen. Uh, we have a very interesting one between Manchester United and Leicester City. 
Uh, that one's going to be on Saturday, December 26th, right after Christmas. So we're going to be enjoying that game real good in the morning. Uh, it, it's two teams that are near the, top, the second versus third place. Obviously, Manchester United are on a ridiculous streak right now. However, Leicester City, you know, can still muster up a win here, or at least muster up some sort of, um, you know, uh, result. They, they need to be looking for some sort of result here. But Manchester United are just playing so well. I'm just not sure if they're going to actually be able to hold them off. I, I see Man U play, winning this game, especially since they're so motivated to win pretty much every game now because, you know, all they have left is the Carabao Cup and the Premier League because they're out of the, I mean, well, they, they are in the in the Europa League. I know they still got that to go forward to, but, you know, with the aspirations they had, I, I know that they're going to be looking at that like, uh, not not a waste of time, but just they're not going to be as motivated to, you know, to win it all the way. But now you got uh, Arsenal and Chelsea, another very exciting game. But, I mean, it would have been exciting, you know, when you thought when you were thinking, you know, entering this season. However, now it's it's a game that Chelsea just needs to take care of. And Arsenal, on the other hand, you know, just looking about as terrible as they probably ever have uh, in 15th place. And incredibly enough battling relegation uh they have never been relegated guys never in their history so for them to be four points away from a relegation spot they have lost four of their last five games but i guarantee you it has been worse than that and some of these losses have been to teams that i mean it shouldn't be that they shouldn't have they they lost to aston villa three nothing they tied against leeds united Lost to Wolves, uh, was it lost to Tottenham, drew against Southampton, lost to Burnley, lost to Everton, and then of course a loss to, well, we're not going to talk about that, that's in the, the League Cup action, but you look at some of these other games they got coming up, I mean, those these are the ones they're going to have to take care of business. Obviously, this Chelsea games, they need, they're, they're going to be looking for at least a draw. Any, any Chelsea fan, any Arsenal fan, I mean would be ecstatic to get at least a draw in this, you know, London affair. But then you got Brighton, need to get a result there. West Brom, Newcastle, well, that's in the FA Cup, my bad. Uh, but still, Crystal Palace, but then they still take Newcastle on in the Premier League. So that's four games that they need to get results in because after that, they take on Southampton, Man U, Wolves, which they just lost to, Aston Villa, Leeds United, Man City. Leicester City just gets worse and worse from there, folks. So, uh, yeah, Arsenal need to take care of business there. And and obviously, the, it, it all starts with this game. If they can get a win, I mean, who knows? It, it, it's, it's soccer. Anything can happen. But that would be a huge momentum booster heading into these four games that are very winnable for them. Uh, but obviously, you you know, you talk to any Arsenal fan, they're, they're not sure where their next win is going to be coming from. So, yeah. Uh, it's just, it, it's a really tough time to be an Arsenal fan. And, uh, yeah, but this game's going to be still an exciting one. Uh, you got Tottenham versus Wolves, another good game. That, I, that, I mean, obviously you got to wonder which Wolves team is going to show up. But also on the other end, which Tottenham team is going to show up. I expect Tottenham to take care of business here. But still, the Wolves certainly have the firepower to win this game. And it's going to be an exciting one to watch. Uh, you got some other games. I mean, Everton taking on Sheffield United. They should get their fourth straight win there. Uh, Man City defeat, uh, taking on Newcastle, which I expect them to win. Liverpool taking West Brom. Uh, that's an easy matchup for them. Aston Villa versus Crystal Palace. I think that should be a pretty interesting one. Not you know not one that, that that's going to be in the headlines, but one that I expect to be um, you know a, a, an exciting one to watch. And Leeds United versus Burnley. I think Leeds United can take care of business there. Uh, don't see Burnley winning that one. So uh, overall, some exciting matchups going on this uh, upcoming weekend. So that's going to wrap it up for this segment. Make sure you guys stick around because when I come back, we're going to be talking about the League Cup action and, of course, some news coming up right after this. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. 
Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back, everyone. If you missed the last segment, I talked about the Premier League, uh, some of the games that happened this past week, and the ones coming up this weekend that are going to be exciting to watch. And now we're going to be talking about some of the League Cup action that happened this past week. I'm even going to talk about the round of 16 for the Carabao Cup that I missed, uh, which we had some interesting games, and uh, you know, you know, I didn't really get into that well. I mean, I think I may, might have, but. Just a little recap, just for us to remember who is in the quarterfinals, which are happening right now. Um, we obviously have some interesting games coming up today or tomorrow, whatever you know time you guys are listening to this. Uh, it might have already happened between Tottenham, Stoke City, and obviously Manchester United and Everton. But uh, let's get right into the Carabao Cup action with uh, the round of 16, which had a couple interesting matchups. I mean, you had Tottenham versus Chelsea. I do remember that game going on where I was expecting Chelsea to take care of business because at this time I was thinking of Tottenham as one of those teams that were just kind of floundering at the moment like just not playing well and, and were kind of out of a rhythm but little did we know this was kind of like the stepping stone for them to be you know just hitting their stride and it, it took them into penalties and of course in that end I think it was Mason Mount that uh, didn't get that last penalty uh, if I'm not mistaken yes Mason Mount missed that last penalty everyone else hit you had Eric uh, Deer, er, uh, Eric Lamella, Pierre Emil Hodgeberg, Lucas Mora, and at the end, Harry Kane taking care of business for Tottenham. While you had Tammy Abraham, Aspeliqueta, Jorginho, and Emerson getting the four for Chelsea. Um, but during the game, uh, you had Timo Werner scoring his goal for Chelsea in the 19th minute, and then Eric Lamella late in the game gives Tottenham hope and sends them into extra time, and then eventually penalties for them to get by Chelsea. Uh, that was a very exciting match to watch. Man City they took care of business against Burnley three nothing. Same thing for Manchester United who took care of business versus Brighton. Which at this point I was still hoping that Brighton and were going to be the surprise team of the season and this would have been a big time stepping stone for that but they were not able to do it Manchester United just defeated them very easily um, you had Brentford defeating Fulham not really anything too exciting there because I kind of expected that to be a tight game I mean obviously to win 3-0 is still pretty impressive for a team that's in the championship but still uh, they were able to defeat Fulham which in my opinion are one of the worst teams in the Premier League uh, you got Everton defeating West Ham 4-1. Uh, you got Aston Villa losing to Stoke City, which, in my opinion, was very surprising. I, I, I thought Aston Villa were going to easily defeat Stoke City, but they were able to get by, uh, you know, on pretty much, in my opinion, it was it was a little bit of luck, but, but still, they, they were able to get by. Uh, probably the biggest surprise of the entire year, if we're being honest, Arsenal defeating Liverpool on penalties it was a goalless draw throughout uh all of regulation but then they went into penalties and it was 5-4 on Arsenal's end and it, it really when you when you when you're looking obviously this was early on in the season and you're thinking ah maybe, maybe Arsenal are just in a bad rut and you know this is something that's going to certainly get them to that next level uh but this was an outlier i mean our Liverpool fans are probably looking back at this and thinking how in the world did we allow Arsenal to defeat us in the Carabao Cup? I do not care if we don't care about the Carabao Cup, but it's Arsenal. They can beat, they can barely beat Sheffield United at this moment. And they're going 
into the Carabao Cup and defeating Liverpool. I mean, and and they had some of their players. I mean, obviously, Ali Song was injured, but they had Virgil van Dijk. They had Salah. They had Jota playing. Milner. I mean, it's just, it doesn't really make sense to me. And it's not like Arsenal had their top players. I mean, they didn't have a bombing gang. They didn't even have Lacazette. I guess they had Saka, they had Holding, Gabriel, Leno, but still. And Pepe, I mean, one of the worst record signings of all time. But, like, it's just, I just don't understand it. I, I, I still don't understand it up until this point. It actually makes even less sense now when I look at it. But still, they get through. And then lastly, Newcastle uh, inching by Newport County uh, in penalties after going 1-1. In regulation, they win 5-4 on penalties. So we had some exciting penalty shootouts throughout this round of 16. And now we're heading into the quarterfinals where we had an interesting matchup between Manchester City and Arsenal. Could Arsenal take care of business once again and surprise people and make it into the semis? No. No, they cannot. They will be playing like they have been playing all season and they lose to Man City uh, four to one. And Man City brought out a good amount of their players. I mean, they had Gabriel Jesus, uh, Bernardo Silva, Mares, Laporte, D- Ruben Diaz. You had the USA international Zach Steffen getting the start there. Obviously, Zinchenko, uh, who's in those uh, transfer talks at the moment. Uh, João Cancelo. So they had a good amount of, of you know strong players in their lineup. Um, and for Arsenal, they had Gabriel, Mustafi, uh, Cedric, uh, Ceballos, Maitland-Niles. Uh, oh, you, you had Gabriel Martinelli getting a little look there. And then you had Lacazette as well, El Nani, who's been playing pretty solid. Uh, but overall, they, they didn't really play too many of their, star, of their strong players, which I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, with how bad the season's going, play, play all your best players and... Try to make something out of this season. Not that it would have made a difference, uh, you know, against this Manchester City team that are just playing so well. Or not, not, they're not playing that well this, but but they're obviously still better than what Arsenal is bringing out so far. And uh, but yeah, their their EFL Cup season ends here. Uh, Gabriel Jesus got off to a really strong start in the third minute, gets a goal with there. Uh, Alexander Lacazette answered in the thirty first minute, but that was pretty much all she wrote for Arsenal as. In the second half, you had goals from Riyad Mahrez, Phil Foden, and Laporte. Uh, pretty much all within all three of those within 20 minutes. And that was all she wrote for Arsenal. 4-1 loss. And their Carabao Cup season ends in the quarterfinal. And now you go to the other side. Not as, you know, big of a name. You know, big name clubs here with, with Brentford taking on Newcastle. Uh, but... Still, it's two pretty evenly matched up teams, even though Newcastle, obviously, they're in the Premier League. Brentford have been playing pretty well in the Carabao Cup, and they were able to win this game, one nothing over Newcastle. And as a championship squad heading into the semis with a chance to take on one of either Man City and then either t- and then Tottenham. I mean, I don't think the Tottenham will lose to Stoke City, but I guess Stoke City, Man United, or Everton. I mean, you got some very tough teams there, but you're gonna you're gonna have Brentford in there, the little team that could. I say that all the time for all those you know small teams, all those you know little clubs that you know are are, you know really balling at the moment. So you know, good for Brentford to make it to the semifinal. That that's huge for their season, and you know it was just a very very uh, exciting game. I mean, it was one zero, but it's just. Uh, exciting for any Brentford fans, uh, you know, as Josh Da Silva scores a 66th minute goal uh, to send his team into the semifinal. And now we're going to be talking about the two games that are left, you know, see who, uh, you know, is going to make it out, starting with Stoke City versus Tottenham. And Stoke City have been able to get by uh, defeating teams like, uh, let's see, let me go through this real quick. Beating Austin Villa, which was huge. Obviously, they be, uh, they defeated the Wolves early on in this competition in the second round, which I was extremely surprised by. Uh, and then Gillingham in the third round. So, I mean, they've taken on two Premier League sides. Obviously, none at the level that they're going to be taking on in the quarterfinals, which is Tottenham. Uh, but, but actually, they're taking on Tottenham at probably the perfect moment as they're 
just in a ba- they're in a bad rut right now. And you look at Tottenham at Stoke City's team. Uh, you know, you got Joe Allen. You got guys like uh, Tyrese Campbell, uh, Nick Powell, uh, Ryan Shawcross, uh, Sam Bokes. They got some solid team, uh, you know, players, but obviously none, you know, that are big time headliners. I mean, they're in the championship for a reason. While Tottenham obviously boasting two of the best, like probably the best duo in the world right now. I mean, maybe that they drop down a little bit in that ranking at the moment with the way that Tottenham are playing as a whole. Uh, but just on those two, two, uh, you know, as individuals, they're some of the best players in the entire world right now. And they're, it's obviously going to be too much for Stoke City to handle. And I feel like this is going to be a very easy game for uh, Tottenham to, you know, to win. But still, it's you, this is the kind of game that, that Tottenham can obviously look down on and think that they're probably too good for. And that is a recipe for a disaster. And if Tottenham somehow lose this game, it'll just cause more disruption and just, you know, more doubts into probably the players' minds as, you know, they're struggling in the Premier League. And if they struggle here, it just won't look good for them whatsoever. Um, But I still just doubt that would happen. Uh, Even though I'm sure Jose Mourinho is not going to be putting out all of his best players, which I don't think he needs to. I think you might see some guys that have been, you know, kind of outliers. Like you might see Gareth Bell getting a start here. I, I doubt you'll see Deli Ali, but I'm sure you'll get like a Carlos Vinicius, maybe a Steven Bergwijn. Uh, maybe Joe Hart gets a start here, but I think you might still see uh, Loris get the start in this situation. Um, who else? There was one other guy, uh, Harry... Was it, isn't it Harry Winks? I think you might see Harry Winks, the 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 Wales or no the English. No, I'm thinking about a different guy, but but still, you might see Harry Winks there as well as he. You know, there were talks about him maybe going out on loan. Jose Mourinho shut those down, so obviously he has plans for him, and this might be one of those situations that he uses him. Uh, so you, you're going to see a mixed bag. You, you might still see one of Song um, or Kane, or maybe maybe he benches both of them. So. So, you know, so they get rest for, for some of these other Premier League games coming up. But still, you're going to see a mixed bag of some some regular, uh, you know, starting 11 guys with some guys that are on the bench. I mean, I definitely expect to see Bale starting. Uh, if he doesn't, I'll be extremely surprised. But uh, still, this is going to be one of those games you're going to want to keep an eye on to see if, you know, Tottenham can, you know, change the momentum that they've been on so far. This is certainly one of those games that they can use to get themselves back on track. And then... The other game, which is by far the, f- the the most exciting game to watch tomorrow for the EFL Cup. You have Manchester United versus Everton, uh, two of the hottest teams in the Premier League right now. Obviously, Everton coming off their three-game winning streak. And Manchester United, in, in my opinion, b- being the, the probably the hottest team in the Premier League right now. Um, obviously, their European uh, glory and, and campaign you know, went to a screeching halt after losing to RB Leipzig in that last group stage match. Uh, so now they have just extra motivation to, you know, pretty much do everything they can to get as much hardware as possible everywhere else that they play. And this is one of them, but it is not going to be easy. Everton, in my opinion, one, were one of the hottest teams early on in the season, uh, obviously died down a little bit in between now and, and then uh, Hamish Rodriguez not playing as much. I think he's dealing with some injuries. But, you know, now they've, you know, won three games in a row against some top... I mean, even though Arsenal's not top competition, but they beat Arsenal, they beat Leicester, and they beat Chelsea. Got a draw against Burnley, but then lost against Leeds United, beat uh, Everton, uh, beat Fulham. They did get a 3-1 loss to Manchester United, so obviously they're going to want that revenge now. Uh, but these last three games have been pretty dominant. Only allowed one goal in the, in the three, and... They're going to be a tough team for Manchester United to out. But I still am leaning in Manchester United's direction because, I mean, they're just playing so good right now from uh, the back line, obviously, De Gea to that front three with uh, Martial, Rashford, Bruno Fernandes, and whoever they put on that right side. I mean, whether it's Greenwood, uh, who, who knows, Daniel James. I mean, regardless, it's just they're, they're playing so well together. 
I feel like Manchester United will come out on top, but this is still going to be a very, very exciting game to watch. And make sure you guys tune in for that one. You're not going to want to miss it. And so that's going to wrap it up for the EFL Cup. Uh, you know, so, so make sure you guys focus on those games that we got coming up. Uh, but we got another League Cup that happened this week. The DFB Pokal Cup. And we had some pretty interesting uh, matchups going on. We had some crazy upsets with Hoffenheim losing to Firth. Don't, no, not sure how you spell it, but they lost in the second round. They got 2-2. Two, two. They, they started the game off hot. Kramaric getting a 13th minute goal to start this thing, to start it off. But then Ernst, Sebastian Ernst for Firth gets the equalizer to seven minutes later. And then just after halftime, Hoffenheim take the lead 2-1. You're thinking, I mean, all right, this team's going to take momentum. It's Hoffenheim. They've been, you know, playing so well in the, in the Europa League. You know, they're, they're, they've been getting a little bit more momentum in the in the Bundesliga. They're going to win this game. Yet, they give up a goal. Oh, my apologies. Actually, Firth got off to the hotter start, got up 2-1, but Hoffenheim answered right back. So, But still, even with that, even with it being 2-2, you expect a team like Hoffenheim to take advantage of the competition in front of them. Yet, they went to penalties, and you know, whenever it goes to penalties... Anything can happen, and that is exactly what happened. Firth won in penalties, seven to six, and 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 it's just it's just a terrible way for 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 Hoffenheim to get out of this competition. And Firth, they lost, they they missed their first um, penalty by Maximilian Bauer, but then they they went four in a row, and and Kevin Vock missed for Hoffenheim. Um, uh, what was it Bagard? Missed for Hoffenheim again, but also Sebastian Ernst missed for for Fern for first, and then after first, my bad, Jesus, and then after that, it just kept on going until it went to seven uh, six six. Kasim Nuhu missed Hibbs for Hoffenheim. Marco Meyerhofer scored in uh, to make it seven six for Firth, and they win and move on to the next round. Just a huge win for them. But just a terrible loss for Hoffenheim. Just you got to look at more that way. It's just impossible not to, uh, because you got teams like RB Leipzig, uh, Leipzig, Jesus, uh, RB Leipzig, uh, de- taking care of business, defeating Augsburg three to nothing. Expect exactly what you would expect from them. Schalke, they won their game three one, and they've been playing like one of the worst teams in the in the Bundesliga. So I mean, obviously they're taking on Ulm. I mean. One of the teams, I'm looking at them, they're in the region of Liga. I don't, I, don't, I don't even know. I'm pretty sure that's one of the, you know, that's, that, that, I don't even think that's, that's not Bundesliga 2. That's probably underneath that. So obviously they're, they're not, a, you know, a big time club. I mean, they don't even have a logo on Google. So, I mean, that should tell it all for you guys. But then you got Köln taking care of business there, 1-0. You got Union Berlin losing 3-2 to to Panderborn. Like, come on, Union. Uh, like, I'm always rooting for them because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're one of those teams that kind of like Granada in La Liga that I'm kind of rooting for because of the, you know, I, I like their story that they just made it into. I say this all the time. They made it into the Bundesliga for the first time last season and performed very well. So for this to happen to them, and, and they even get rewarded with an own goal. So it, 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 technically it's like 3-1 if they don't get that own goal from... A Panderborn, and they got off to a terrible defensive start. Allowed three goals in the first half, and out of their nineteen shots, only four were on target for Union Berlin. So it was just very sloppy, sloppy game for them. I expected much more from that side, uh, but then you look at the the Borussia teams: Dortmund winning against Eintracht Braunschweig uh, two nothing. Uh, you know, taking care of business there, which you, again, you expect from them. Matt Hummels scored in the 12th minute with a header. And then you got Jadon Sancho in extra time just to, you know, seal it for them to go on to the next round. And then you also got Mochin Gladbach, just 5 nothing, absolutely dominating SV Elversburg. And, yeah, that was pretty much the, the gist of this team. They mo- more than half of their shots were on target. They had 72% possession, 90% pass accuracy of 790 passes. They were just clicking on all cylinders. And, you know, they could probably use this kind of momentum to play even better 
in the Bundesliga, which they've obviously been struggling, which we'll talk about in the next segment. Uh, and then you had some of the lower uh, tier teams. You had D- Darmstadt uh, taking on Dynamo, and Darmstadt were able to win 3 nothing. And then now you have the rest of the games coming up today. Uh, Wolfsburg taking on SV Sandhausen. Uh, Dusseldorf taking on Essen. You have a pretty st- solid Bundesliga matchup between uh, VFB Stuttgart and SC Freiburg. Uh, I'm always looking. Ex- I'm always excited for F- uh, SC Freiburg to take on, uh, especially one of the more exciting teams this season in the Bundesliga in Stuttgart. Um, and then you got, of course, Bayern Munich taking on Holstein Kiel, which you know you got to expect them to win, but that's not until January 13th. Not sure why that got suspended, uh, you know, postponed that long. But then you also got Bayer Leverkusen versus Eintracht Frankfurt. Of course, it's a game you expect Bayer Leverkusen to win. But with Frankfurt, you know, they're, they're, they haven't been a terrible team in the Bundesliga. I mean, they're what, what are they, like uh, mid-table, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But it's just not, doesn't want to show me at the moment. Of course it doesn't. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure Eintracht Frankfurt is like a mid-table club this year. And... You know, it's like they can they can easily pull off a, an upset here, uh, but then you also got Mines going up against uh, Bolsham and Werder Bremen taking on Hanover ninety six. So uh, definitely though the one to watch t- today or tomorrow, whatever uh, you got is Stuttgart versus Freiburg. That's going to be an exciting one, and then of course Wolfsburg to see if they can handle uh, their business and take on Sandhausen and defeat them because they absolutely should. So. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for this segment uh, of the league action. Make sure you guys stick around because when I come back, I'm going to be talking about all the other leagues. You know, we got some Premier, uh, not Premier League, we got some Serie A, Bundesliga, La Liga, League 1 coming at you guys next. And of course, maybe a little bit of transfer news that uh, I got uh, looking up right after this. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back, everyone. If you missed the last segment, we talked about the League Cup action, talked about the Carabao Cup, DFB Pokal Cup, and, you know, just got into some of the games. And now, of course, we have some other games going on, uh, you know, later on this week, or I think it's like tomorrow. uh, But we do have some interesting matchups going on to finish out the rounds that are currently happening in those cup matches. And now we're going to be talking about some of the other leagues uh, you know, of course, the other top five leagues, Bundesliga, La Liga, Liga, Serie A. We're going to be talking about all of those uh, leagues and some of the exciting games that have already happened uh, so far. First, let's start off with La Liga because we had some interesting matchups going on. First, Atletico Madrid versus Real Sociedad. We had, Those are two of the top teams in the league. And they've been two of the top teams for some time now. This was a chance for Real Sociedad, who have been playing poor as of late to turn things around and kind of inch closer to Atletico Madrid. Even though Atletico do have a few games in hand, this would just get them a little bit closer to, you know, tying up with them and actually being a threat at the top of the table. 
But that is ex- not what happened in this game. Real Sociedad, who have you know been very poor and have just not had a good run of form as of late, just couldn't get anything going against Atletico's stout defense. Like any time they got close to goal or seemed to you know have some kind of opportunity in the attack, the Atletico Madrid defense just closed the door on any sort of attempts and you know just pretty much blocked them out they only all game Real Sociedad had six shots only one of those were on target and even with the 60% possession that Real Sociedad had they just couldn't uh, you know just put any sort of what is it free-flowing attack with it like no efficiency with those whatsoever they, they you know but but aside from you know the shooting they were playing particularly well against Atletico weren't letting them just take over the game but on the offensive side of the ball, it just was pretty much a complete no-show for Real Sociedad. Even with David Silva in the middle of the pitch, it, it, it was just nothing that they could do. And it was only a matter of time before Atletico Madrid scored and took the lead in this game. And that is exactly what happened. As um, Marcus Ro- uh, had Mosso scored the opening goal of this game with a header to pretty much shut this game out it was pretty much over at that point because Real Sociedad just weren't putting anything together and once they had that opening goal you can kind of already tell it was already you know just game over for Real Sociedad Atletico Madrid though were able to get a second goal in this game with a Marcus Llorente uh, just blistering shot from outside the box it was a, a couple bounces here and there that you know that landed right in front of him but that shot was not going to be stopped by anybody and it made it two nothing and obviously then sealed the deal for Atletico Madrid to win this game continue their ridiculous form in Serie A as they have now won four of their last five games and have them squarely at the top of the table with 32 points in 13 games. That's 10 wins, 2 draws, and a loss. I mean, it's just incredible. And that loss was against Real Madrid recently, which obviously made it a little closer because they do have Real Madrid just behind them. But still, with a game in hand on Real Madrid, they are up by 3 points. So, honestly, early signs are looking very good for Atletico Madrid um, and because they don't really have much... Uh, threatening them other than Real Madrid who are obviously you know like I was expecting to be one of the better teams coming into this season they're certainly playing that way and they do have a game coming up today against Granada which I'm very excited to watch because those are two uh you know obviously Granada I'm always rooting for because they're one of those low teams that you know people don't usually expect to be near the top of the table but they have consistently been in the top half of La Liga since they uh, entered the league or got promoted last season and uh, even though they have been they did lose a few games uh, a couple weeks ago in a row they are back on track and they have a draw and two wins in their last three games and are looking to stay in that hunt for one of the European spots don't know how viable it will be for them to get it because, I mean, even though they do have a few games in hand on the teams above them, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. I mean, they have Sevilla, Barcelona, Villarreal, Real Sociedad, Real Madrid, and Atletico Madrid ahead of them. All very, you know, high-quality teams, teams with big budgets that are certainly going to be trying to make moves in the January transfer window. Not sure what Granada is going to be doing there. Haven't heard anything on their end on the transfer rumors or any transfer news. So I'm not sure if they're going to really be making any big time moves. I'm sure they're just going to be hoping for that um, in club development from guys like Herrera. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going to be happening there. But still getting uh, if, if they can somehow pull out a result, maybe even, you know, if they can get obviously they're going to be aiming for a draw here. But if they can get a win, that would be a huge boost to them. And it was as it would be their third win in a row. And would obviously put them tied with uh, Barcelona with a game in hand on them. So, uh, well, well, no, of course, if they win this game, then they would obviously be, uh, you know, at the same amount of games as them since Barcelona already played their game in match day 15. But uh, talking about Barcelona, they took care of business, uh, defeating Valladolid 3 to nothing, and they needed to. Because if they wanted to have any sort of chance to, uh, you know, 
take on Atletico Madrid or, you know, challenge them for the league title, which even with the win, it's not guaranteed. I mean, there's still eight points behind them with Atletico Madrid having that game in hand on them. So they can easily be, was it, 11 points behind. So there really is a slim chance of them winning, but they need to take care of the games against these teams, like Valladolid, who are literally in a relegation battle. So uh, they did just that, winning 3-0, and it was a comfortable win. Uh, they were consistently getting opportunities in the, the Valladolid final third. We're not letting them get any sort of rhythm. And you look at the stats, it represents that. They had 62% possession, uh, 21 shots to Valladolid's 12. Uh, 10 of those 21 were on target. So they were certainly being very efficient with their shots. And even though Valladolid, you know, weren't disrupted in terms of having, uh, you know, their, their, their passing, uh, you know, comfortably, uh, you know, completed they had 85 percent pass accuracy so they were certainly getting the ball around but they just couldn't get as many shots on target and weren't and whenever they did ter Stegen halted them they they did get most of those shots late in the game when barcelona pretty much already had a handle on the win uh so for the most part it was an overall great performance from barcelona something we need to see from them more often if they want to you know, challenge for that title spot, even though, I, you know, the odds of them really winning it at this point after dropping so many points early on in the season are, are pretty slim. Uh, but they can certainly get into that Champions League spot. I mean, I, I said it in the last segment or the last episode, I said they were, you know, they were certainly going to go for that Champions League spot. Um, if Real Sociedad continue to drop points, I mean, they got three losses and two draws in their last five games. I said that certainly will happen. Um, and then even Villarreal, they got four draws in their last five games. Uh, that's just dropping points consistently. They have eight draws already this season. That's more than half of their games. So they're certainly going to have to at least get a few more wins here and there if they want to continue to be in a top four spot. Uh, while Barcelona, you know, you always expected Barcelona to eventually get into a rhythm. Same thing with Sevilla, which are in sixth place. They've got three wins in their last five games. You know, they're they're getting into a rhythm. Obviously, I expected them to be one of those top three teams, but that is obviously not the case. You got, you know, Atletico and Real Madrid leading the pack at the moment with both having four wins in the last five games. And that's where we're at with La Liga. So now we're going to move on to the Bundesliga where uh, we had the last few games before uh last few games of the new year happened uh this past week which i pretty much or past weekend which i talked about in the last episode but the two the two games i did not get to talk about were sc freiburg versus hertha berlin and we had wolfsburg versus stuttgart sc freiburg were able to absolutely dominate hertha four to one uh they got an early goal from vincenzo grifo in the seventh minute uh, they were answered by Dodi Luke uh, Bacchio in the 52nd minute to make it 1-1. But then after that, they scored three goals to make it 4-1 and pretty much take care of business. One of them being uh, their all-time leading goal scorer in Niels Peterson. And honestly, it was just one of those games that, yes, even though Hertha were, were you know in it for most of the game, you kind of felt like SC Freiburg were eventually going to pull away because they were just playing a lot better, more organized uh, Hertha certainly had more more possession, but SC Freiburg were just a bit more uh, organized and efficient on that attacking end, and that's certainly why they were able to pull away with this win and get a 4-1 victory and keep themselves in that uh, tenth spot. I mean, they're obviously still you know ways away from from challenging for a Europa League spot, uh, which is kind of where I had them going into the season. But three wins in a row and two draws before that are certainly not a bad start to getting them back in that contention spot. They are only five points away from Dortmund for that fifth spot, so anything can happen there. Um, And that is certainly a great way to finish off the year. And then lastly, we have Wolfsburg, who uh, defeated Stuttgart 1-0. This is a big-time game for them as they were pretty much right there with Stuttgart. uh, They had 21 points while Stuttgart had 18 uh, so, so obviously a win for Stuttgart would have had them tied with Wolfsburg and uh, very close to a Europa League spot. But now these two teams are heading in opposite directions at the moment. Wolfsburg with three wins in their last five games. Stuttgart have two, but they do have a loss and a draw in their last two games. So, you know, certainly haven't been playing at the level that they were early on in the season. Uh, 
with uh, you know their attacking style and being one of the you know better offensive teams in the league. Wolfsburg, on the other hand, they they're not a very dynamic attacking team, but they beat you with defense and and they play their game. They've only lost one game all season, and that is why they are in fourth place at the moment uh, with twenty four points in their thirteen games. And you just got to be impressed with the way they've been able to continue to play their game and are in one of those top four spots. They're in a Champions League spot at the moment with Dortmund dropping so many points, dropping three, uh, losing three games in their last five. Uh, it, Wolfsburg had taken advantage and they're now ahead of Borussia Dortmund in the standings. Uh, just a huge way to end the year for them. And of course, at the top of the table, like as we've expected, you got Bayern Munich with 30 points. Uh, they've dropped a few points here and there, and that's why you know you got teams like RB Leipzig and uh, Bayer Leverkusen inching just a bit closer to them with 28 points apiece uh, as the year ends up. And and this is going to be a very exciting Bundesliga race. But the thing is, we thought that heading into last season, where you had Borussia Dortmund ahead, and you had a few teams ahead of Bayern Munich, who obviously started off the season, you know, really bad. But this isn't the same. Borussia Dortmund, uh, Bayern, Borussia Dortmund, Bayern Munich are playing ext- pretty well. I mean, obviously they've dropped a few points that uh, that game against Hoffenheim where they lost you know, terribly, and then three draws after that. But uh, you know, you're getting some good competition from Bayer Leverkusen and RB Leipzig, who are just as are playing just as good. Just have an extra draw, um, you know, each, which is why they're two points behind Bayern Munich. Uh, so this is, I still think this is going to be a very exciting uh, title race all the way through. Not sure if Bayer Leverkusen or RB Leipzig can keep it up. Certainly Bayern Munich are going to stay up there. But if those two teams can continue to play at the level that they are, this is going to be one of the more exciting Bundesliga seasons that we've seen in a long time. Uh, next, we're going to be moving on to Serie A, where we have match day 14 already underway. Uh, as today we had... Juventus losing to Fiorentina 3 to nothing as Juan Cuadrado picked up a red card early in this game and when I saw that tackle I felt terribly for that guy like I mean for the guy who bro cuz Cuadrado with the cleats up it, I mean just went right into his like right over his foot and it and it looked like he could have easily broken his leg I mean, that's the kind of tackle that you could break a leg in. So absolutely, uh, no doubter, it was a red card. I mean, I've, I've, at first, the referee gave Guadalajara a yellow card. And I was thinking, I mean, there's absolutely no way this stays a yellow. I mean, he probably just didn't see it all the way through. He went to VAR, saw how bad it was, changed it to a red. Absolutely agree with that call. And it put Juventus behind the eight ball. Especially with them already down one nothing from a goal from Vlahovic. And it didn't get any better from there because Alexandro late in the game got an own goal. He I don't know what the heck he was doing. He didn't he wasn't even looking at the ball. He like turned his head and just flailed his leg out and it and the ball rolled in off his foot. It just it, it was a terrible defensive play. I don't know what like what's going on with Alexandro because he's been there was a you know a year maybe two years ago you would have considered him one of the best fullbacks in the entire world. I didn't even put him in my top ten when I was considering top ten fullbacks in the world. You know a bunch of episodes ago. I don't even remember when I talked about that, but still I didn't even consider Alexandro because he's fallen off so much and it's because of plays like this where he just doesn't even like it looks like he doesn't even know what he's doing out there and and he doesn't you know put much on the offensive end anymore and it, it was just a bad bad loss and then former Juventus player Martin Caceres uh it, it scores in the 81st minute to make it three nothing and just shut the door on Juventus and it, it, what a bad loss for them as their title hopes are just falling are, are just dwindling away because you look at AC Milan and Inter Milan at the top of the table Inter Milan at the moment have won five games in a row Five in a row. While you have Milan, you know they've also they dropped a few points here and there, but they're still at the top of the table with thirty-one, and then Inter Milan with thirty, and then you got Napoli, Juventus, and and Roma tied at twenty-four. That's obviously already a sizable gap, and it. I don't think it's going to get any better because AC Milan, Inter Milan, you know, obviously Inter playing 
in in the Champions League were absolutely terrible. But that just means they have more motivation. I mean, they're not even in the Europa League. So all of their focus is on Serie A right now. So you can understand why they're playing at the at the rate they are. And they have the best goal differential in the entire league. And I doubt they're going to be, you know, anything worse than top three. Maybe you get a run from one of these top teams. I mean, obviously you're assuming it'd be Juventus. But this was one of those games that you just, it, it, they, it just can't happen if you're Juve. It just can't happen. Especially with the other teams around you dropping points. Napoli, Roma, and Sassuolo have each lost their last game. Napoli two in a row. So if you're Juve, you need to take care. Of, you need to take advantage of these teams, especially when you're going up against Fiorentina, which are in 15th place in the league. This is their first win in. Let's see how many games. Let's see one, two, three, four, five. I'm not gonna count Coppa Italia. Six, seven. Eight? No, nine. This is their first win in nine games. That's that's just terrible when you're Juventus. And, and you have no excuses. You have Cristiano Ronaldo playing now. So there, there's absolutely no excuse to say that we don't have him. You know, you know, we're not into a rhythm. He's been with you for a little bit, for a while now. And it, obviously being down a man hurts. But at, when you're at the level that you uh, that you are when you're Juve, you need to win that game. Uh, you had another game between Crotone and Parma that ended 2-1 in favor of Crotone. Uh, obviously, two teams that are near the bottom of the table. This was a you know big-time win for Crotone as they are trying to get out of that relegation zone. Only two points behind Spezia. And they do have two wins in their last four games. So, certainly, you know, starting to get... Uh, and those are their only two wins of the entire season so far. So, obviously, they're, you know, trying to do what they can to get out of that relegation zone. And that was certainly a good start. Uh, so now we have some pretty interesting matchups. You have Milan, AC Milan going up against Lazio. That's a, that's a big time game, even though Lazio have certainly not played at the level that you expect from them coming into this season. The defense has been very atrocious and the offense has not been at the level that you kind of thought. Like obviously the defense was never going to be, you know, world class. But you expected Lazio's offense with, you know, like I've always said, Immobile and Luis, Al- Luis Alberto to be at the top of this league. Or near the top, at least. And it's, at the moment, it's mid-table. It's mid-table. And that's not going to cut it when you have the defense that Lazio does. So, uh, not sure how well they're going to do in this game. I mean, obviously, with the offense that they have, with the play, with you know, the kind of quality that they have in that front uh, attack. Anything can happen, but Milan are just playing so well. They haven't lost a game in Serie A all season long. Uh, obviously, it's just 13 games. There's still a lot of there's still a lot of season left, but this is not a game that I expect them to lose. I expect them to take care of business. At worst, there's a draw, but I do expect to be I do expect there to be a lot of goals in this game. Uh, you have Napoli taking on Torino. You know, one of the worst teams in the league. Napoli have to take care of business there. Uh, after they've lost two games in a row, after three wins in a row before that, in their last five games, they need to win. And one of those losses were against Lazio, another against Inter. So, uh, and then they, they just need to take care of business. Uh, those two losses are, you know, not looking good. They didn't score in any of those games. Uh, before that, they looked very well. I mean, defeating uh, Sampdoria 2 1, defeating Crotone and Roma 4 0. And obviously, when it comes to those top teams, they have not answered the call. This is one of those games that they have been winning and they need to win, to, you know, coming up. Now, quickly, we're going to go to Liga, which really the only thing I want to talk about is how boring that PSG versus Lil game was. A 0 0 draw against two of the best teams in the league. You're expecting this is one of those games that, you know, they can make a little bit of distance between, you know, one or the other. In the title race. And this was a chance for PSG to step up. And reclaim first place in Liga. And they just did not do it. It was just such a boring game. There was almost nothing going for either team. I mean. Eight shots apiece. PSG only had one on target. Lille had three. And even though PSG had 70% possession. It seems to happen all the time. Yes they had possession. But if you don't have Neymar in there. For some reason they just can't create anything. And why is Mbappe on the bench? I, I just don't understand it. And then really the highlight of this play. Was of course a defensive play. I mean why wouldn't it be? It's 0-0. 
but Kimpembe. I mean, my God, what a sliding tackle from him. Probably the defensive play of the year so far. Because he was, it was him versus like four other Lil players. It was a four-on-one uh, counterattack, and he was able to get a ridiculous slide. Uh, I don't, I don't remember who this guy was. Number seventeen, uh, uh, Yilmaz. He was able to get a sliding tackle on him and save PSG a loss in this game. And it's just, but that just shouldn't be when you're PSG. It, it drops. It, it, it really. I don't even know what to say, man. It really makes me wonder, like, what they think when they go into these games. If they think it's like, oh, it's still just Lil, like, we got this. It shouldn't be that way. So, regardless, that's going to be it for this segment. Make sure you guys stick around because when I come back, I'm going to be talking about the top 10 Denmark players right now. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back, everyone. If you missed the last segment, we talked about all the action going on in the other leagues. You know, of course, we talked about Bundesliga, Serie A, Ligue 1, and of course, La Liga. And, you know, just talked about all the games that happened just as we were heading into that Christmas, uh, you know, day and, of course, the end of the year. And now we're going to be talking about the top 10 current Denmark players in the world uh, we have a couple interesting names on this list, some that I never expected to be as high as they are, some that I, you know, kind of not sure why I maybe put them on this list, but I kind of had my hands tied, not sure who else to put here. Uh, and then, of course, we do have some very good names on this list as well. So let's get started with number 10, Andreas Christensen, the 24-year-old center back from Chelsea. Uh, he's got 186 matches played, 176 starts to go with seven goals and two assists. And for Denmark, he's got 35 caps and 30 starts. Now, we start this list off with uh, someone who I don't really like the game of. Uh, he's very good with the ball at his feet, you know, can certainly make very good passes. Uh, and has made some some incredible passes for a center back. Kind of makes passes that you would expect from a, you know a, a deep line playmaker. Um, however, it, it's just his defensive skills. I mean, he, he sometimes he shows some great you know so, some very in, impressive skills on that end. You know, to be able to you know with how tall he is, he's able to get in the way of a lot of players, and is and he's very athletic, so he's able to keep up with attackers. But his defensive IQ certainly is not there, and it's something that lacks big time in his game, and and that's why he doesn't get a lot of consistent time with Chelsea. And at 24 years old, he certainly still has enough you know time to uh, you know improve his game and. Uh, He just needs to get consistent playing time, which is why I believe he needs to get a move away from Chelsea, especially now with Thiago Silva there and Zuma playing outside of his mind. Andreas Christensen is not going to get any type of consistent first-team play, uh, so he needs to make a move away uh, because at the moment, he's kind of falling down this, this, this Denmark pecking order. In my opinion, I don't even feel like he should be getting regular uh, starts for the Denmark national team. I have someone a little higher on this list that I feel that should be getting those mom- those minutes, and um, so so yeah, he's just hanging by a thread on my top ten. There were a couple guys that I was you know maybe thinking about putting in front of him, but still, I mean, he still has the potential to be a very good uh, center back and one that Denmark could you know need to use for the future. Um, but, uh, yeah, at the moment, Christensen's just very inconsistent for me to put him any higher on this list. 
Uh, and number nine, we have Thomas Delaney, the 29-year-old center defensive midfielder from Borussia Dortmund. Uh, for club, he's got 318 matches played, 258 starts to go with 30 goals and 22 assists. And for country, he's got 47 caps, 41 starts to go with five goals and two assists. Now, Thomas Delaney, uh, th this season has kind of you know fallen out of favor in Borussia Dortmund. Obviously, a lot of talent that goes through there. And, but before he did, he was a very vital piece to their midfield uh, to be able to you know help out on both ends. Obviously, on the defensive end, he's a very efficient tackler, has high defensive IQ, and you know just just pretty much holds it down. is is an anchor at that center defensive midfielding spot. However, he also on the offensive end can make very good forward passes, has a very good vision, um, you know, to help out in these in those attacks and can make runs himself, uh, you know. But but just isn't you know crazy athletic. It's just very it just has a very high IQ and uses it to his advantage. Um, but still, I feel like Thomas Delaney needs to make a move away because uh, still at 29 years old, he's still got a lot of you know soccer ahead of him. Uh, so if he can make a move away, probably would be making a move to a, you know, a, a smaller club. But still, to be able to get, you know, regular first team action, um, that's going to be very important for him, especially with uh, Denmark needing his skills uh, for for competitions like the Euros and uh, you know just upcoming national team competition, especially the World Cup coming up. Uh, it's all going to be very important for Delaney to get regular team or just get re regular playing time. Uh, which he is not getting at Borussia Dortmund. But still, Thomas Delaney is a very uh, versatile midfielder, box-to-box -box midfielder, and, and he does it all for Denmark and, and, you know, Borussia Dortmund. Now at number eight, we have Kasper Dolberg, the 23-year-old striker from Nietzsche. Uh, for club, he's got 142 matches played to go and 102 starts to go with 53 goals and 12 assists. Uh, and for Denmark, he has 22 caps, 10 starts to go with five goals and two assists. Now, uh, some people, when they when you guys listen to this, might think that I have Kasper Dolberg just a bit low on this list. The thing is, I just I I don't feel like he's getting the kind of exposure that he should be getting with Nietzsche. They're they're playing extremely poor this season, and it, it's surprising that he's been able to do as good as he has been with them. You know, I mean that that uh, ratio that he has of fifty three goals. It's a total. It's a sixty five goals or assists in a hundred and forty two matches played. That's very very strong, and he certainly has the potential to be a top striker in the world. But uh, the thing is, he's just not getting. You know, I don't know. I just feel like he's not being pushed the way he needs to be pushed at a club like Nietzsche, and it's kind of showing because he's not he, like. Compared to his days at Ajax, I feel like there was much more hype in his game. Now, I, I don't feel like it's there as much. I feel like he's, you know, it, it, it's, he's kind of played the same, just getting older. So he needs to make a move to not a bigger club, just just a different club. I would think maybe somewhere in the Premier League where, he, you know, he'll, he'll get more consistent competition and uh, he'll need to get better at his game. Like, because at the moment, I feel like he's just standing still. Still is a very great striker. Uh, can, can is very dangerous with that right leg, and um, is a very good passer as well. His technical skills are very solid, and for his size, he's very athletic. So uh, Kasper Dolberg is certainly going to be the future striker for Denmark if he not already, you know, if he isn't already, but uh, needs to get better at a few areas for me to put him any higher on this list. Now at number seven we have Janik Vestergaard, the 28-year-old center back from Southampton. He's got 267 matches played, 239 starts to go with 20 goals and one assist. And for Denmark, he's got 17 caps and nine starts to go with one goal. Now Janik Vestergaard is certainly having one of the best seasons of his career, uh, especially with Southampton playing as good as they are in the Premier League. It's just a good thing that those two things are coinciding. But but, but Vestergaard is absolutely a staple for Southampton in that back line. Has been playing extremely well for them since he's joined and uh, is, is one of their key pieces. I mean, he is a s extremely big player. Uh, it certainly helps him in those aerial duels. 
and and he's very smart on the defensive end as well. Rarely makes those mistakes and commits a lot of fouls, um, and and can certainly help on the offensive end as well. Doesn't get up and make forward runs. I mean, obviously he's a center back, but uh, can certainly be strong with the ball at his feet and makes very good passes. Um, but overall, I think Janik Vestergaard is one of those players that should certainly get more looks uh, for Denmark over Andreas Christensen. They, there's no reason that Christensen should have more than twice as many caps as Vestergaard when he's four years younger. I, I just I don't feel like Christensen has been show, has shown enough for that to be the case. So uh, Vestergaard is at number seven and, and maybe can go up a little higher on this list. But uh, I feel like this is a very good spot for him. At number six, we have someone I never expected to be here. Martin Braithwaite, 29-year-old striker for Barcelona, is playing easily the best soccer of his career. Uh, and, I mean, it's it's incredible that it's happening at Barcelona, honestly. Uh, for club, he's got 330 st- uh, matches played, 258 starts to go with 79 goals and 24 assists. And for Denmark, he's got 41 caps, 28 starts, to go with six goals and four assists. Now, Braithwaite is one of those strikers that, in my, at first I wasn't thinking this, but now I I feel he's one of those guys any team would want on his, uh, any team would want on uh, on their roster because he is, uh, he, he works so hard. His work rate is easily the best of anyone on this list. And he's a good goal scorer, obviously. I mean, he wouldn't be a striker if he wasn't a good goal scorer. But he, it's just that his runs and, and you know, of course, he has pace with that as well, which it, it kind of surprises you. He, the, the, when you look at him, he doesn't look like he has that sort of agility and pace, but he definitely does. Um, but you combine that with the work rate, and he makes so many runs to open up things for the attack. He, it, It's invaluable, really. And it's why Barcelona are using him so much and why he's been such a hit there. And and it's incredible because a lot of the time when players go to you know Barcelona, I pretty much one one perfect example is Philippe Coutinho. They don't really rise to the occasion and end up being where Coutinho is now, which is on the transfer market and possibly leaving Barcelona. But then there's guys like Braithwaite who take that challenge and run with it, which is exactly what he's doing, and that's why he's the sixth best Denmark player in my opinion at the moment. Uh, at number five, we have Yusuf Polson, the 26-year-old forward from RB Leipzig. Uh, a very versatile forward, uh, can play pretty much anywhere on that front line. Uh, you look at his club stats, he has 271 uh, matches played to go with 203 starts. And uh, to go all oh, with 203 starts to go with 18 goals and 5, no, my bad, 69 goals and 44 assists, getting my players mixed up there, and for country, he's got 48 caps, 37 starts, to go with 7 goals and 7 assists, now, you look at those stats, and it it really much says exactly what I, it spells exactly what I just said, he's an extremely versatile attacker, isn't just a, you know, a a goal scorer, even though he can certainly play that number 9 spot, and is a great target man, Uh, is very tall, so he certainly works in those, uh, aerial duels as well but he's a very unselfish player you know gets his teammates involved so often is great in link up play uh his technical skills are still are also very good uh, as he can create for himself and for others and is overall just a great player to have on your team uh he joined RB Leipzig uh you know a, pretty much 7 years ago when they first uh you know became a team and, or, you know, well, they weren't first being in a team, but but it's been a while since he's been there, uh, back when they were even in the, the, the third tier of the Bundesliga, and has been with them ever since. Uh, the loyalty has certainly been there, uh, something you don't very, you don't see very often uh, in soccer, and, I mean, Yusuf Poulsen is just one of those players that you need to have on your team if, you know, you just, at least for depth purposes, but he's certainly a very, very skilled player, and at just 26 years old, He's still got a lot of great football ahead of him, so he's going to be a very important piece for Denmark's future. At number four, we have Simon Kajar, the 31-year-old center back from AC Milan. Uh, For club, he's got 404 matches played, 388 starts to go with 18 goals and 5 assists. And for Denmark, he's got 82 caps, 79 starts to go with 2 goals and 4 assists. Uh, The highest capped player on this list... 
Uh, Simon Kajar just shows his his value and worth day in and day out. Is an absolutely uh, skilled defender. Can you know have the ball at his feet and is very uh, composed with it there. Uh, but is also one of the smartest defenders that you can find, um, you know, in the world. He is. He has pretty much been everywhere. He's been at four of the top five leagues. The only one he's missing is the English league, and he's been to so many teams. He's been to a, a, a site like unlike Polson, because Polson has pretty much been with just two: one uh, from Denmark, and then pretty much RB Leipzig the rest of his career. But Simon Kajar has been with, I, I, if I can remember, about like ten different teams. I've never seen anyone be on that many different teams, so he's certainly been there and done that, has seen it all, has the experience, and he's used all those experiences to become the set, the defender he is today, which is a very poised and, and, and you know, one that that it just gives any kind, any team, any fan, you know, just, I guess, uh, what, what what's the word I'm trying to say? Uh, just comfortability, that, that he's there, he's going to take care of business, and he's very he's very smart with his tackles. Can you know st- whether it's standing or, or sliding? Uh, he rarely commits fouls, and uh, j- is just overall a very smart player and, and one that any team would would love to have. And Denmark is very lucky to have there in that back line. Uh, at number three, we have Pierre Emil Hosberg, twenty five year old center midfielder from Tottenham. Uh, he's got two hundred and twenty three matches played. 165 starts, 7 goals, and 11 assists. And for country, he's got 34 caps, 27 starts, and 3 goals. Hodgeberg is easily the most versatile midfielder on this list. Can do anything on the defensive end, but is also very adept on the offensive end with his passing abilities. Hodgeberg is is your your typical box-to-box midfielder and at 25 years old he still got so much more room to grow and 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 develop his game uh i mean he's he's the third best Denmark player in the world easily and uh that move to tottenham was a big one for him and he was with southampton for a long time uh but now he's a regular at uh tottenham and it just goes to show the type of skills that he has can pass the ball with the best of them can you know defend very well has a really high work rate and, and does it all for any team he plays for. At number two, we have Kasper Schmeichel, the 34-year-old goalkeeper from Leicester City. Uh, he's got 537 matches played, 536 starts, to go with a 731 save percentage and 185 clean sheets. And for Denmark, he's got 55 caps and starts, to go with a 795 save percentage and 26 clean sheets. And honestly, it's one of the things I, I just love to see when a player who is obviously still good in club, I mean, he's you know been with Leicester City for pretty much as long as I can remember, and he's been such a staple between those sticks. Uh, but then when he goes to play for country, he takes it up a notch. He easily plays better with country than he does with club, and you can tell he loves to wear those colors, and he you know, and he respects it, and and you just love that out of a player. Uh, but at you know at 34 years old he's obviously getting up there in age he's starting to get past that prime years of a goalkeeper starting to get up there um, but he's still going to be the goalkeeper for Denmark he I mean there's nobody even close to him on that end and I mean his um, reflexes are still top notch his positioning is easily one of the best in pretty much in the entire world and there's just uh with Kasper Schmeichel between the sticks, Denmark is pretty much in any game, guaranteed. Uh, and now at number one, we have Christian Eriksen, the 28-year-old attacking midfielder from Inter Milan. He's got 480 matches played, 399 starts to go with 101 goals and 136 assists. And for Denmark, he's got 79 caps, 74 starts to go with 29 goals and 11 assists. Uh, an absolute dynamite attacking midfielder can do pretty much anything in the attack. And, and in my opinion, is one of the best attacking midfielders in the entire world. His vision and passing ability are top notch. Some of the best you'll find anywhere. And the only problem is that he's not getting a, like consistent playing time for Inter Milan. That was supposed to be a big time move from Tottenham to Inter but it has backfired. He's not getting much playing time. He was coming off the bench last season. 
I feel like he needs to. I mean, unless things change, he needs to move somewhere where he's going to be more, get, getting more consistent playing time. At 28 years old, he is in the middle of his prime and shouldn't be wasting it on the bench uh, because when he's playing, he is easily one of the best attacking midfielders in the world. I mean, he can do it all. He his technical ability is is absolutely incredible. Uh, his passing, like I've said, and vision are you know, t- you know elite tier. And, and he can score with the best of them. He's, he's got some incredible wonder goals under his belt. And, uh, you know, for, for Denmark, he is the attack. He's the engine that runs it all. And it just every single game shows how important he is, um, you know, in, in what they do offensively. And if he's not there, they, it, it's almost impossible for them to create offense on their own. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for this segment. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed, but as always, thank you for listening to the GSMC Soccer Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review, that really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, and have a great night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.